It's my great pleasure to introduce our colloquium speaker for the, this, this year's Women in Mathematics program, Laura Ryder. She obtained her PhD under the direction of Pramod Ashar at Louisiana State University in 2012, and is now an assistant professor at the University of Georgia in Athens. She works in geometric representation theory and has written some 10 papers and given many talks on her work. She has wonderful poems from the Poetry Society on her webpage. I invite you to take a look. I was enjoying them. It is now going to tell us about her own form of poetry in the shape of a talk on geometric categorifications of the Hecker algebra. So, Laura. Yeah, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, yeah, it's really, uh, yeah, I appreciate that. The, the analogy with poetry is, um, completely poignant where like here and I think one of the first things that drew me to math was this idea that it was this little world where things just kind of worked out perfectly and you could argue your point and it didn't matter who you were or where you came from if you were using the words correctly then nobody could tell you that you were wrong <laughs> um, and real life is a lot more complicated than that so we have to as mathematicians, we have to be willing to go back and forth between these two worlds, allowing ourselves to kind of get immersed in that um, magical kind of poetic land where, where beautiful things happen and then be willing to pull ourselves out again and work with um, real life where, I don't know, everyday situations kind of contradict each other and like things just don't seem so straightforward. Um, that being said, math is really hard. <laughs> So it's, um, even if it's a beautiful endeavor, it's still a challenging one. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is Hecke algebras. So this algebra is sort of an overarching, um, kind of incarnation of, of everything that I want to understand in math for the time being. Um, so I want to, with my talk, try to convey to you why Hecke algebras are so useful and um, give you some, some different ways to think about them. So that's my main goal. So the first definition for a Hecke algebra that I'm going to give you is, um, is my favorite one, but it, it's probably not the first one that most students see. So you start with your favorite finite group and a subgroup And then you can associate to this pair um, an algebra. And this is really um, the algebra that deserves the name Hecke algebra. This is defined to be a set of functions. So I'm gonna call this H and it's the H corresponding to this pair. Oops, that should be a G. And so I wanna take all functions on the group and then you have some choice here for what you put. I'm gonna put the, the complex numbers, um, but you could attempt to put maybe the integers um, if you're a little more daring. Um, and you want to only keep the functions that are invariant with respect to the left and right multiplication by elements of your subgroup. So that's, um, yeah, let me for all H. H prime and H. All right, so for this to be an algebra, we need a multiplication. So the multiplication is given by convolution. And I'm gonna use convolution elsewhere in my talk, but um, a more difficult version of this. So I think I'll tell you what this is here and then you'll just have to proceed by analogy later on. So I can convolve two functions. And so I need to say um, what it does to an element of x. And so I take this finite sum over all elements in my group where I take the first function evaluated at um, x times the h inverse and then my second function evaluated at the h. And then um, oftentimes we um, divide by the size of our group. And so this is, um, this is a heck algebra. All right, and if I start to write off the page if something's not visible or if I start using notation that hasn't been defined or something, feel free to stop me at any point. This, this talk is a little bit of a hodgepodge of different, different things. 
Okay, so um, the reason that heck algebras are so important in, in what I study is because they tell us about the representation theory of, of groups. So I wanna discuss now a special case of this. Um, let's take our group to be a semi-simple algebraic group. And, um, and again, I want this to be a finite group so that it sits in this framework. So let's define this over a finite field. Let's say the finite field with P to the K elements. So you're welcome to keep in mind um, something like SLN, the special linear group, as an example. And then for the subgroup, I want to take um, what is called a Borel subgroup. So for, for matrix groups, this will look like upper triangular or lower triangular matrices. And then in this in this special case with this, this being my finite group and this being my subgroup, I have some additional structure that I can use to understand this set of functions. I have something called uh, the Bruja decomposition, which allows me to decompose my group according to um, this subgroup. And then what pops up are, are these certain representatives um, in what is called the, the vial group. So this is the vial group and this is a finite group that can be associated um, to any semi-simple algebraic group. So in our working example, um, the, the associated vial group would be the symmetric group on N letters. And I can actually view this as being, um, I'm gonna put subset in quotes as a subset um, of my group SLN. And this is, um, um, maybe it, it, it's easier here, but then I have to remove this word semi-simple. If I put the general linear group, if I put the general linear group, then I can literally see this as a subset by taking the collection of um, permutation matrices. Um, so that's my subgroup, that's the Bruja decomposition. And so that tells me that if I'm looking at these functions um, defined on this group, that I have a basis um, in terms of these double cosets. Um, these are just the, the indicator functions um, for one of these double cosets. So let's call this phi sub w. And then um, uh, we also have a unit, which is just phi corresponding to the identity element in this group. Um, so this function is um, exactly one on a single point. Um, so anytime I'm in the Borel, I get one. And then if I'm elsewhere, I get zero. All right, so um, some remarks. So for the special case, um, normally we renormalize this convolution op operation. So we replace um, dividing by the order of G with um, the order of the Borel. And then the second remark that I wanted to make was that um, when I originally defined this, I said, let's put the complex numbers here, but maybe if you're bold, you wanna to try to put the integers here. Um, and the problem is with this convolution operation, it's not clear when I convolve that I'll still end up with a, with a function um, defined on the integers because I'm dividing by something. And so this is also a remark that I can make about this special case. If we divide by the order of B, then the Z valued, let me make sure this is still okay. Then the Z valued functions um, are preserved by convolution. So maybe we call this um, 
H sub V inside of RH. But I might be a little sloppy with my with my notation. All right. Cool. Any questions, comments? All right, so that's our first venture into um, HECA algebras. Um, the, the second one, this is the one I think that when I was a graduate student, this is the version that I first saw and I didn't understand why we cared about this. Um, so this is usually as a, as a presentation in terms of generators and relations. Um, so I think I, I want to tell you what these generators and relations are. Um, yeah, I think I'll tell you what these generators and relations are. Okay, so, so for this setup, um, if I want generators and relations, then I have to understand um, this vial group a little bit better. So this vial group W um, associated to your, your favorite connected reductive algebraic group or semi-simple algebraic group, this is generated by a collection of, of simple reflections. And there are um, lots of different ways to write down a set of generators. And so I guess what I want to emphasize is that these come from the data associated with G. So this is um, important. This gives W the structure of a coxeter group. And depending on which simple reflections you pick, um, you will get a different coxeter group structure, even if the underlying um, finite group is, is the same. So, so for this um, second version, I need to know what these generators are. So this is the, the Heck algebra associated to the pair, the, the group with its simple reflections. And so we've lost We've lost the big semi-simple group and its Borel, and we're keeping um, the vial group and its simple reflections. So I'll call it H sub W here. And this one, um, we're defining this as an algebra over these Laurent polynomials. And so I give it a basis um, according to the vial group. Um, so I want it to be free over this algebra with this basis. And then I need to tell you what multiplication is again. There's no functions here, so I can't tell you anything about convolution. Um, so how do I want to multiply two of these basis elements? Well, what I'd like to do is I'd like to just, these are elements in a group. So I'd like to multiply the elements in the group W and say, well, this, this matches with this. Um, the problem is this, this, is not, this is not what we want to do. This is looking a lot like the group algebra of the vial group, um, which is not what we want. What we want is we want to remember, um, we want to remember something about these simple reflections. Okay, so we need a condition to put here. All right, so the simple, the, the, the part of the structure of this vial group is that the vial group comes with a link function. So I can associate to any element in this group a non-negative integer. And I want this link function to satisfy the fact that every simple reflection um, has length one. So in this way, um, in this way, I can talk about the length of an element by saying, well, how do I multiply these simple reflections together to get that element? And then I just um, count in a, um, in a reduced way how, how to write out that element. 
And so if I want to be these to multiply in the naive the, in the naive way, then I want this to only happen um, if the link associated with the product is the same as the the sum of the lengths. So that seems like a um, realistic thing to, to hope for. Okay. Um, and so now when does this um, when is this not satisfied? So this multiplication tells us a lot of things, but it doesn't tell us to multiply. How do we multiply a simple reflection with itself? Because if I have a simple reflection, um, then of course this is going to multiply to give me um, the identity element in the group again, uh, because it's a reflection. And this has length uh, zero, um, so now I've, so, so when I multiply these two, I don't get something of length two, I get something of length zero. So we have a special rule. So here's the first rule for our multiplication. The second rule for our multiplication is when we multiply a simple reflection by itself. And here's where my um, Q comes in. Um, so, I want to remember that this came from um, the simple reflection S, but I adjust this by multiplying by Q minus one. And then I get um, the basis element corresponding to the identity element. So this is for, for simple reflections. So you can see if I evaluate Q at the number one, then what I just get is the identity element. And that looks, again, this looks like the group algebra, um, which is not the heck algebra. So there's this sort of like, there's um, the sort of idea where I'm like, well, I have the group algebra and then I have the heck algebra. And I like to think about this as being sort of the skeleton of whatever algebraic structure I'm thinking about. So for me, this is typically um, a connected reductive algebraic group. And so, um, so this is what I care about in, in my research is I wanna understand this connected reductive algebraic group. That's really hard. So let me try to study its representation theory and that's really hard. And so, um, so I take a step back and I find this, this skeleton W and if I look at the group algebra here, I'm just getting the representations of the file group itself. Um, and there's no meat on it. There's no, there's no flesh here. And so the way that you build up the flesh is you have to pay attention to um, whenever you have a simple reflection that cancels out with itself. And so the way that you do that is you add on this parameter, which seems like, it seems like you're not really adding that much extra information. You're just adding an extra parameter that'll sort of keep track of um, this multiplication. Um, but that, that's exactly the flesh. So here's the flesh. This has flesh. And this is sort of, I'm thinking of this as the cues. I don't know why I like this analogy, um, but I do. And I think it's kind of remarkable that somehow, you know, if you want to study dinosaurs and you find a dinosaur skeleton, then you can kind of look at that skeleton and say, oh, it was this tall and maybe it ran really fast or it walked really slow based on the size of its bones. But if you wanted to know what the dinosaur sounded like, then you would need to look at its flesh, right? You need to look at its vocal cords and try to measure that. So if you want to, if you want to see more of your group, then you need some some flesh. And somehow this parameter is enough, which is I think the really remarkable thing about Heca algebras is that just adding in this Q is enough. And it's kind of counterintuitive until you um, really investigate um, how to see this Q geometrically. Um, yeah. Okay, so more about, um, let me tell you some facts about this Heca algebra. 
Um, so this is generated as an algebra by the basis elements corresponding just to the simple reflections. And of course, we can write down um, any, any basis element, we can write it down as a product of these um, basis elements of the simple reflections, as long as when we look in the vial group, we multiply these simple reflections to get this vial group element and it's, and it's reduced. So I don't have any cancellation occurring. Um, another observation is um, that all of these basis elements are invertible. Okay, so you can see that um, pretty clearly here. So there's your identity element in the group. And so you say, well, let me try to solve um, solve this for the identity. And what you find out is that the inverse element, at least for a simple reflection, looks like um, the basis element for the simple reflection, but then I have to multiply by a power of q, and then I have to add q to the negative one and subtract off um, the identity element. <laughs> Um, and then another fact that I wanted to share about these uh, is that this, this algebra has what is called a bar involution, usually written as a bar. And this bar involution is defined by um, well, on the Q's, I want to take the negative power, the negative exponent. And then on the standard basis, I want to invert my vial group element and then take the multiplicative inverse of that. All right. Um, and I don't really want to tell you this theorem, uh, but I think that I will anyway. So usually when people introduce the Heck algebra in terms of generators and relations, they immediately jump to this theorem. So this is due to Kajdan and Zustig. Um, so, so I have a standard basis here given by T's and you can find another basis and we'll call this H's, H's with an underline. And the first property that this satisfies is that when I take the bar involution, um, I get the same element back. Now, if I just if I just left this as the requirement, then I can find a basis satisfying this, but it won't be unique. There's more than one basis that has this property. Um, so if I want this to be uniquely specified, then I need to do the following. So you write this uh, new basis element in terms of the standard basis. So you have to, to look over all elements of the vial group and say, what is, what is the coefficient of my standard basis element here? It's going to be some kind of um, polynomial in terms of Q, Laurent polynomial in terms of Q. And so, so this polynomial in terms of Q, of course, depends on what we're writing in terms of the standard basis. So that's my W and then I have a coefficient for each of these. So that's my X. And then I'm, uh, it looks like I've adjusted this. So I've pulled out a power of Q here. So the power of Q I wanna pull out is negative length of this element W divided by Q. It's not so important, it's just a normalization factor. Um, and there are different normalization factors depending on which references you're looking at. Um, 
And these, these coefficients here satisfy the following condition. So I'm always going to get zero unless um, x, here's some notation I think I haven't written down yet, x is less than or equal to w. So this means, this less than or equal to means that I'm looking in the vial group and I can find x as a subword of w by deleting some, some simple reflections. Um, B, if I take the coefficient where I'm writing W, well, then I'm going to get a TW that shows up. What's the coefficient of that TW? It should just be one. And finally, if X is strictly less than W, so it's not equal to, then this coefficient is a polynomial in Q. And we have this degree condition, uh, which again, isn't super important uh, for the purposes of this talk, but it is very important to, to sort of specify the spaces uniquely. All right. So um, sorry, could I ask a quick clarification question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, is the statement that um, there exists a unique basis satisfying one and two moreover ABC hold, or is it there exists a basis satisfying one and two such that PXW satisfy ABC? Uh, good question. Um, I think, um, I think I want such that A, B, and C, because okay, again, so there I, are additional conditions, otherwise it may not be unique. Is that the, yeah, yeah, exactly. I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, um, so here's some examples. And these are the most important examples for this algebra. Um, if, if, you're, if you're trying to figure out what this basis element is, well, for the identity element, it's just, it's just the standard basis of the identity element, which is just the unit in your algebra. Um, and if you want to figure out what this is for a simple reflection, then you need to find um, a polynomial that satisfies these properties and it has this TS with multiplicity one and it's self-dual. And so this is, um, this is the polynomial that satisfies this. Sorry, I have a train tracks right next to my house. All right, so part of the reason I wanted to tell you this theorem is just because it's the easiest way to define um, these polynomials. These are called um, Kajdan Lustig polynomials. And again, I, I feel like I've heard of these over and over and over and over again as a graduate student and I was like, but so what, they have something to do with the heck algebra and we're here to learn about, I don't know, Lie algebra is like, why are we talking about this? Um, so hopefully by the end of the talk, um, you'll have an idea of if you care about representation theory, why, why you're talking about this. Okay, so um, now some, some geometry. So I told you two versions, two versions of the heck algebra and so I want to sort of tie these two versions together. So this, this heck algebra associated with the pair, um, a semi-simple group and its Borel, this is often called Iwahori Hecka as opposed to just Hecka. 
And that's because um, Iwahori back in the 60s um, gave, gave a presentation. For this algebra. So he wrote down this um, generators and relations um, algebra. And then this is a theorem. If I, if I take these generators over um, my Laurent polynomials and I evaluate that Q at the correct um, power of P so that I have the, the correct finite field showing up here, then the algebra that I get is this algebra with the, just, just with the Z value functions. Okay. So here's, um, this is completely algebraic. It's just in terms of the vial group and it's simple reflections. And this is where you start to see like, oh, there's some geometry here. So this is why I think this should be our first definition of the Hecke algebra. This should always be our first algebra, our first definition of the Hecke algebra, because this is where you can get some intuition for what's going on. I don't know, maybe some of you are gifted at looking at equations and gaining intuition from that, but I that's never been my, my strength. Um, so here I feel like I have intuition because I know like, oh, I have this semi-simple group. It has a maximal torus. It has a Borel. I know how to conjugate these things. I know my Bruja decomposition. So I have some, enough structure here to where I can sort of visualize this algebra. Um, and so we want to beat this side up quite a bit so we can see even more geometry. Um, but before we do that, I want to take a brief interlude or maybe I don't want to do that because I'm talking rather slow. Um, so maybe just an aside because I think I'm not going to have enough time for this. I said something in my abstract about mentioning the affine version. Um, so you can do this for an affine vial group, which is um, not no longer a finite group, but it, you can still get this as a coxeter group. Um, and then the group, instead of taking a group defined over FQ, you can take a group defined over um, Laurent series in Q. And then instead of a Borel, you can take an Iwahori. And if you do the same setup for this setup, this is called the affine. Algebra. So I'll return to this if, if miraculously it turns out I have enough time at the end, but um, I'm not so sure if that's going to happen. Okay, so geometry. All right, so we know we want to study B invariant functions on G, so we replace are right B invariants with, um, let's say condition, I don't know, um, with using um, the flag variety. Okay, so, so the group G that you start with um, has the structure of an algebraic variety. And then the Borel is a closed subgroup. So I can take this quotient and look at cosets. And this also has the structure of a smooth algebraic variety. Um, and it's also projective. Um, so in our running example, Um, maybe I take G to be GLNC or SLNC, and then my Borel is upper triangular matrices, 
Um, and so in this situation, the flag variety, I can parameterize um, this set as just um, complete flags in in dimensional in an in dimensional vector space. And so what that means is I'm looking at ways to sort of decompose um, in dimensional vector space as a sequence of subspaces so that the dimension of the i step is exactly i. Um, and in the special case of GL2, this just looks like um, complex projective space. Okay, so that's, um, this is our geometry that we want to study. And again, we return to the decomposition theorem, not the decomposition theorem, the uh, Bruja decomposition. Um, and this gives us what is called a stratification. So this is a way to decompose the smooth algebraic um, variety into subspaces. Um, so let's condense this notation a little bit. Let's let x sub w be um, the quotient of this double coset. This is often called a Schubert cell um, because it is isomorphic to, um, let's see, I put complex here. So this is isomorphic to um, an affine space and its dimension is the length of this vial group element. And then um, when I take the closure of this, this is often called a Schubert variety. And this is um, projective, but singular, often singular. So this is the way I want to decompose my flag variety. So for instance, if I look at my P1 example, then the stratification that I get is, well, my vial group is a symmetric group. So I have the identity element and one simple reflection. So corresponding to the identity element, I get a point. And then I get um, an affine space of dimension one corresponding to a simple reflection. And that's my stratification. And when I take the closure of this cell, I include this point. And in this case, it's, the, it's not singular. Um, but do, do. Let me, yeah, maybe we'll do a more complicated example, which I can't draw. Um, if I'm looking at GL3, then again, I said, you only need to know things about the, the vial group in order to see this picture. So this time I have the symmetric group on three letters. And so I have two simple reflections, let's call them S and T, and then I can multiply them. Um, in, in these ways, and, and this is my set. And so if I want to look at the flag variety, then I look at the way the, the way these multiply together. So I get um, a point corresponding to the identity element. And then I have two simple reflections. Those correspond to these one dimensional cells. And in their closure, I get this point. And then I have these two dimensional cells and in their closure, um, I get these lines, but then I also get um, these sort of complementary, not complementary lines, whatever, I don't know what to call them. And then I have my biggest cell, S, which is three-dimensional. And, um, and that's the big open part of the flag variety. So this is, um, this is what the flag variety looks like um, for GL3 or SL3. Um, so now I want to um, 
study some geometry here. And so we'll, uh, we want to use a replacement for functions. So this is by invariant functions um, with sheaves. So these functions um, were locally constant. Um, and so these sheaves, instead of locally constant, I'm going to use the word constructible. So constructible sheaves are sheaves that are built out of locally constant ones. Um, and you can write this all down carefully, but, but really what we care about is the analogy um, here. And so the, um, the category that I care about uh, looks like this. So this is um, full subcategory of, um, let's say the derived category of C valued sheaves on the flag variety. So all of your sheaves have to live on a variety. And I want them to be, um, I want them to satisfy this sort of condition, constructible with respect to this B action. So, um, so full subcategory with objects, with sheaves, constructible with respect to um, the Bruja stratification. So it's a little off the page there. All right, so your objects Um, I said sheaves here, but that's not really correct. Um, because I'm taking derived category of sheaves, these are really complexes of sheaves. So the objects here are complexes. Um, and I mean, of course, they satisfy some finiteness conditions. So if I take the, the cohomology of this complex, I want it to be zero almost everywhere um, for almost all i. Um, and I want this constructibility condition. where it's built out of locally constant sheaves. All right, when I do this, I can associate um, a table of stocks. <clears throat> And so this table of stocks, I um, write down my different Schubert cells. And then I put them, I put them heading up the different columns of this table. And then in this, um, and then I label the rows by integers. And then what I fill in this table with is, um, is I take my object in the derived category, I restrict it to the Schubert cell labeled by vial group element J, and then I have the integer in here and that tells me let's take cohomology and degree M. So what I end up with this, because these are constructible, this is just a constant sheaf of a certain rank. So I just put the rank of this constant sheaf. 
Um, so you could just think of this as this is essentially the same as a vector space, and I put the dimension of the vector space on this um, on this spot. Okay, so the reason I'm doing this is so that I can tell you some objects in this derived category. What I want to do is just talk about sheaves, but unfortunately, sheaves don't work. We have to work in this derived category. Um, so what does this table of stocks look like? If I'm looking at this GL2 example, then we have two cells. And I can take the constant sheaf on this full P1 and write down its table. And um, And I want to write these, this is a bit of a bad notational things. I want to write this table so that my um, strata are descending in dimension rather than ascending. Um, and so for this constant sheaf, I only have cohomology in degree zero because this doesn't, this isn't a complex or it is a complex just concentrated in a single degree. And then the rank, when I restrict to here, I just get constant sheaf rank one. When I restrict to a point, I get constant sheaf rank one. So there's my table. All right, so um, definition. So F in this category is perverse if, um, if the table of stocks and it looks like this. Okay, so it needs to be, it needs to have this triangular position. And what I mean by that is if I take the stratum labeled by T, let's say, and I write the integer minus the dimension of this stratum, then I'm allowed to have something in cohomology equal to minus the dimension of that stratum or lower. I'm never allowed to have something above. Um, and so I, I'm only allowed to get things um, being non-zero below the diagonal. And then the second condition is, um, is a, is a dual, dual version. Um, so if you know about Poincaré duality, this is um, an analog of Poincaré duality. Okay, so, um, so those are perverse objects in this category. And then we have some special ones. Um, so pick your favorite um, Bruja cell. So this is the five variety. Um, then there exists a unique object and I'm going to call it IC. And the object um, depends on this W that you pick. So I'll just I'll just abbreviate that to ICW. And it's characterized by the following properties. Um, so the first property is support. So the support of this object, so this is in general, this is a chain complex and not just a sheaf. The support is the closure of this Bruja cell, Schubert cell. And the second condition is this, um, if I take this object and restrict it to the open stuff inside, of the flag variety and take the cohomology, um, then 
here I have this minus dimension of this cell showing up again. I need to get rank one in exactly the cohomological degree equal to minus the dimension of the stratum and zero everywhere else. And then my final condition is that if I take any, um, any cell inside the closure, oops, this is a W. If I take any cell inside the closure, except for the open one, then when I restrict to this cell, the smaller cell, then this cohomology, it's perverse. So it's not forced to be zero, but it is forced to be zero at exactly this one spot along, um, along this diagonal here. So I want it to be zero for all I greater than or equal to minus the dimension of this stratum. Okay, and, and, then, a, and then a dual version dual condition. Okay, so this, um, this collection, these are, these are called intersection homology sheaves. And I have exactly one for each for each Schubert cell, which is the same as saying I have one for each element of the vial group. Um, and so I want to take all of these together. So definition, let's define semi-simple. All right, so I want this to be a subcategory here. Um, and the objects, I want them to be finite direct sums of shifts of, um, of the ICWs. Okay, so shift, um, yeah, maybe I can say this. I mentioned this example with P1, and I said, oh, let's look at the constant sheaf on P1. This has table, um, that looks like this. And this does not satisfy the definition of the theorem because this has dimension one, so everything here would need to occur in degree minus one or below. So this one is not perverse. It doesn't satisfy the definition theorem that I've written here. But if I take a cohomological shift of this so that I regard this as a chain complex in the derived category, but shifted, so now it's in degree minus one, then all of a sudden its table looks the same, except everything is occurring in degree minus one. And so now this object satisfies the definition of this theorem. So this is, this is exactly the IC labeled by the simple reflection um, S for S2. Okay, so, so for semi-simple complexes, I want to allow all shifts of these and finite direct sums of them. And I have one for each vial group. So in this example, I have one more because I have two vial group elements. So the other one, um, I see sub identity. This is just this is just the skyscraper sheaf on a point. Sky skyscraper on C mod B. So I have a single um, single non-zero stock on that base point, and then it's zero everywhere else. And then I take finite direct sums of shifts of these two objects. And this is semi-simple um, inside of G mod B for, for SL2 or GL2.
Okay, so now um, a bit about categorification in the last few minutes. All right, so this category doesn't really have much to it. It's just an additive category. So I can take direct sums of objects in this category. And it also has a shift operation. So if I shift anything um, in this category, then I end up with another semi-simple complex. So I have these two operations um, and I have a third one, which is um, convolution. So I have a way to multiply um, semi-simple complexes. And um, I think I don't wanna, um, say anything more about that. So then um, we can define um, K plus. So this is a growth and deep group. So a typical growth and deep group might be associated to an abelian category or a triangulated category. This one I just want to associate to an additive category. And so this growth and deep group, um, yeah, maybe I'll just say this as a Z module, I just have bases given by these ICs with various shifts. Okay, I can define, um, an action of the parameter Q using the shift operation. So if I want to multiply the class by Q to the negative one, well, I just define that to be, take my semi-simple complex, shift it by one, do a cohomological shift where I move everything down by one unit and now take the, the class of that. Okay. And I can multiply um, classes using my convolution operation that I'm sort of hiding under the rug for the time, for well, for this entire talk, I'm hiding it under the rug. But you know what it looks like for functions. All right, so the theorem is that. Um, is that this is a categorification of the Heck algebra. So the map is called the character map. And it's given by the following. So I'm evaluating it on a complex of sheaves that's really a semi simple complex, but but remember that's made up of these ICs, which are complexes of sheaves. Um, so I can take each of my, um, I can take my sheaf, I can restrict it to the Schubert cell labeled by W, and then, um, and then I can take the cohomology there. That's just a vector space. And so I can take the, the rank of that vector space and then um, I want that to appear next to the standard basis in the Hecke algebra. And I want to, and I want to keep track of the degree of this cohomology with the Q. Right, that's the flesh that we're talking about here. And then I take the sum over all elements of the bio group and over all degrees in cohomology. And so that's, um, that's what I associate to one of my semi-simple complexes. And the theorem says that this is, is a map, is an isomorphism. Okay, so, um, Uh, I think I'm out of time. So I think I'll just summarize with the upshot. So now um, these, um, if you go back and you, uh, 
you look at our Kajdan Lustig basis, then then the the Kajdan Lustig basis is exactly what corresponds to these ICs. So the character associated with this IC is exactly the Kajdan Lustig basis element. And so then you go back and you say, ah, this Kajdan Lustig basis element was defined in terms of the standard basis. And you had these Kajdan Lustig polynomials showing up. And you can unravel all of this in, in more than 10 seconds. Um, but I don't have that much time to learn that the Kajdan Lustig polynomials, what they're telling you is that they tell you um, the stock. of the IC. So that's geometrically what these Kajdan Lustig polynomials are telling you. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Laura. Let's thanks uh, Laura for this very nice talk. And we have some comments and questions in the chat. There was some kind of uh, a discussion in the chat about Heke algebra uh, that sometimes are referred to the algebra generated by Heke operators uh, on CASPs, CASPs forms, for example, and how they relate with this one that we are discussing. The, the, I don't know if you have some extra comment. There has been some in the chat, some discussion about that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't really know anything about CASP forms, <laughs> uh, but I'm sure it is related. <laughs> uh, but we need another expert to explain that. And another question uh, from Shana uh, is, is there a six operation in this formalism when we have Verdier duality? Yeah, so, um, yeah, that's a good question. So the six operations, um, now let me go back a little bit. So here, if we want to see the heck algebra, we have to use these semi-simple complexes. The six operations are defined here. Um, Verity duality, um, you could consider Verity duality to be one of them, depending on, I don't know, I think of the six operations as being my four sheaf functors and then sheaf hum and sheaf tensor. And so I can combine, I can combine those to get Verity duality. Um, but this is preserved by by the Verity duality functor, but the other six operations I have to work here. I have to work in this bigger category, which somehow, believe it or not, this bigger category loses information. This bigger category only tells you about the skeleton. If I decategorify, um, this is telling me about the group algebra of the vial group. If I really want to see the skeleton um, with, the, with its flesh, then I need to look at um, just these semi-simple complexes. Does that make sense? Thank you. We have some other questions coming. So Karina is asking, uh, is the cohomology defined, Karina Hong, sorry, is the cohomology defined related to each cohomology? Uh, yeah, cohomology. Say that again. Oh, it's, it's, it's the same as singular cohomology. So if I take these algebraic varieties and then give them the usual topology and then take singular cohomology, that's what I'm getting. Thank you. And then Nelima Borade is asking, what's the analog of Kastan Lustig in the Finn-Hecke setting? Oh, it's the same. It's the same. So, so in the affine Hecke setting, um, this so so the usual thing is G mod B. In the affine, I take take your favorite reductive group and then evaluate. Um, I want to do things over the complex numbers, so I'm going to do Perron series over the complex numbers, and then instead of modding out by a Borel, I mod out by what is called an Iwahori. Um, and so if I do this, I still get a Bruja decomposition of, of this group, sometimes called a loop group. Um, the, uh, maybe I can tell you briefly what the Iwahori is. The Iwahori sits inside of this subgroup um, where I take my group defined over power series. 
And if I evaluate T to be zero, then I, then I literally get the Borel um, inside of the group. And so I still get a Bruja decomposition for this, but now I have infinitely many um, cells that show up. And so these are now indexed by the affine vial group. And so I can take semi-simple complexes defined in exactly the same way, except now I'm working in this slightly weirder setting. So you have to do a little bit more legwork to see that you're getting something um, realistic to work with. Um, and then, um, but you can define semi-simple complexes in exactly the same way. And then you still have a convolution operation and this categorifies uh, the affine HECA algebra. I don't know if I answered the question. Yeah, the analog of Kajdan Lustig in the affine Heck algebra setting. So, so then, so then I do the same thing where I um, rewrite the the IC basis, Kajdan Lustig basis, in terms of the standard basis, and those are the Kaj, the affine Kajdan Lustig polynomials. Thank you, Laura. Are there any other questions or comments for Laura? Okay, if not, let's thanks Laura again for this great talk. <laughs>